Hi, my name is Nicholas Caravolius, and I'm a PhD candidate at UC Berkeley, where I study rice developmental genetics and physiology. While I find my research very interesting, uh, today in my talk, I'd actually hope to share a bit more about, uh, broadly about gene editing uh, for climate change and agriculture. It's really an honor to be here, albeit virtually, back at my alma mater, where I got my bachelor's degree in agricultural sciences. And so thank you for the privilege uh, of having me today. And uh, I'm very excited to share our team's research findings in terms of how gene editing has been applied for climate change in agriculture, and also share a bit about the synergies between gene editing and uh, more conventional breeding. And so with that, I'd like to begin with telling you a bit about my background. And so these folks here are my parents visiting me here out in the Bay Area. And before they made it to visit me in San Francisco, they immigrated from the small island nation of Cyprus. Now, uh, this nation is economy is driven primarily by agriculture and tourism. And so my paternal grandparents had uh, farms where they raised citrus crops and olives like the ones that you see here. Um, so agriculture has always been a part of my kind of ancestral narrative. And I've seen firsthand how individuals like my parents have been impacted by agricultural innovation. So I just wanted to establish a bit of context for why I'm really inspired to do this work because it represents uh, my family's history. And when my parents came over to this country, they actually continue to work in the food industry. So food has kind of always been in the narrative and I can see the ways that technology can be incredibly potent in establishing uh, the livelihoods of folks like my family. And so with that, I'll transition to tell you a bit about what I hope to achieve today. And so I would like to provide an overview for how gene editing has been applied in crops and in livestock to address climate change. Um, and in doing so, I'd, I'm going to bring in a few case studies that really help emphasize just how potent this technology can be. Um, I also hope to draw in the uh, synergism that can exist between breeding and gene editing and conclude with some final remarks. So as you've all probably are well aware of, climate change stands to impact the food system quite negatively. And uh, the environmental outcomes of climate change are wide ranging and quite severe. Uh, climate change might facilitate increased salinization, en enhanced droughts, um, increase the concentration of CO2, temperatures. These are uh, statistics and phenomena that have been looming for a while and that we have been aware of. Um, and I just want to emphasize here how devastating climate change is and will continue to be in terms of agricultural systems. Um, some of the impacts that we can anticipate are increased disease severity as a result of expanding the host ranges of a lot of pathogens or disease causing agents, decreasing the ability of crops and livestock to manage their resistance to disease among a plethora of other uh, impacts, heightening the disease severity in crops and livestock. Uh, projections more or less always converge on an understanding that yields, whether it be in crops or in livestock, will be lowered as a result of the impacts of climate change. And we can also anticipate lower nutritive quality, primarily of our crops. So collectively, we know that climate change will negatively impact our food systems. And uh, this figure, this understanding of how climate change will impact our food systems is not necessarily all encompassing, but meant to highlight kind of the most poignant impacts that we can anticipate. So with this bleak understanding of food systems in the face of climate change, I hope to create a little bit of hope for us and understanding what can we do about it, specifically in the lens of gene editing. And so the work that has uh, surfaced to address climate change in agriculture has converged in four major traits. And those are disease mitigation, enhanced yields, abiotic stress tolerance, and nutritional improvement. And all of these traits or phenotypes stand to be affected by climate change. Um, and so it's very hopeful or promising to see that there has been a large body of work 
and embracing the realities of climate change and being able to address them quite effectively through the applications of gene editing. Um, and so I want to share a bit about what that work has looked like on a temporal scale. So there's been a really recent surge of innovations that have been facilitated by gene editing. And you can see here in both crops and livestock, uh, this figure is skewed left. So there's been a primarily a large surge of innovations that have happened recently, uh, especially if you look at the year 2018, for example. And this is largely, this recent surge in innovation, I believe can be largely attributed to the uh, innovation of CRISPR-Cas9 editing. And so the first eukaryotic cells were edited in 2013 and regenerated plants were occurred for the first time in 2015. And so you can see that CRISPR-Cas9 and the advent of uh, ability to use CRISPR-Cas9 in vivo has really facilitated a recent surge of innovations, which is exciting and creates a lot of promise for how gene editing innovations will continue to emerge and continue to be a potent mechanism to address the emerging and current uh, uh, impositions of climate change. And so beyond temporal scale, uh, understanding that gene editing can be applied widely uh, biologically. So you see here separated in green for crops and purple for livestock, the range of organisms that have successfully been gene targeted. I mean, there is an expansive set now of organisms that have uh, had this technology successfully applied to them. And you can see that uh, these organisms range from staple crops like wheat and maize and rice all the way to more um, locally important crops like ground cherries. And so this is a really exciting understanding that this technology can be expansive for global staple crops, um, local populations, and, um, and um, among a variety of traits. And you can see the same is true in livestock. Um, there are quite severe bottlenecks in livestock editing uh, in terms of regeneration and tissue culture that are need to be surmounted in order to expand the range of organisms, uh, livestock organisms that can be targeted for improvement with gene editing. But this figure is meant to establish an understanding that Gene editing can indeed be applied to a wide variety of organisms, and this enhances the potency that gene editing technology uh, stands to offer. And so what is that potency? What has this technology achieved? Um, you can see here a gallery of figures of gene edited organisms, all for different traits. And so everything highlighted in orange is a yield improvement trait. In blue is nutrition quality improvement trait. Uh, red and abiotic stress tolerance trait, and in green is a um, disease resistance trait. And so I think let's start with the orange because they're the most visually striking in my opinion. You can see a uh, red sea bream on the left, one that's been edited at a single locus, the MSTN gene, which is a locus uh, myostatin gene thought to be able to increase muscle mass. and based on visual inspection, I say that is indeed the case. Uh, red sea bream that had been edited uh, accumulated 16% skeletal muscle on average. Um, below that, you can see that same locus being targeted in cattle and the cow on the right is a little bit more muscular than the one on the left. Um, alternatively, you see that yield improvements have also been achieved in uh, crops, uh, in this case, tomato promoter editing of important uh, tomato inflorescence and developmental genes uh, yielded fruit with increased uh, locule numbers and fruit size. And so I think that's a very striking image of how uh, gene editing could be applied to enhance yield. What's more is in nutrition, you can see the beta carotene accumulation uh, in this banana that has been facilitated by a knockout of a single gene. Um, in chickens, you can reduce the amount of fat accumulation on the GI tract, um, which will be an important uh, mechanism for lowering the negative food uh, quality attributes present in livestock. You see on the bottom left in rice, a gene editing approach that enhances saline resistance. Um, 
like I mentioned previously, climate change is anticipated to increase the salinization. And so uh, you can see uh, that plant on the left, that's wild type. And on the right are uh, rice plants that have been edited for a single gene and they are uh, growing larger by far on average. And then finally, we get to disease resistance and crops and livestock. So the pigs that you see are ones that have been gene edited successfully, and they are resistant to um, foreseen respiratory virus. And so when challenged with the virus, these pigs are the only ones that survive and their counterparts, their wild type counterparts actually need to be euthanized because of the severity of the disease. And finally, you see on the right, um, field trials of gene edited rice plants for broad spectrum resistance. In this case, they're challenged with rice blasts in the field. And you can see that the rice on the right looks a lot healthier and will yield on average 50% more per uh, hectare based on having a single gene edit, a single locus. I think at this point, given the data shared, it's undeniable that gene editing is an incredibly powerful technique and technology to facilitate improvements in crops and livestock alike for uh, addressing climate change and addressing uh, uh, performance issues beyond the impositions of climate change. Um, and so this is an incredibly exciting technology, but it by no means does it forego um, or lessen the importance of conventional breeding techniques that have existed before gene editing and will continue to persist beyond it. As you all are well aware, uh, alternative breeding mechanisms are incredibly important. Um, before I transition to describing the synergies between gene editing and breeding. I just wanted to highlight one final example uh, where gene editing had been ap applied um, to ground cherries and using information garnered from tomato to be able to increase fruit size. Um, and you can see here, increase uh, flower uh, uh, patterning as well, or modify flower patterning. And so it's exciting to see how gene editing can be expansive in terms not only of improving major global staple crops, but also enhancing the performance of more locally adapted um, uh, crops like ground cherry. So similar to breeding, gene editing is increasingly gaining the capacity to be potent uh, as disruptive technology and in local economies and in local food systems as well as globally. And with that, I'd like to speak a bit more about how gene editing and um, conventional breeding coalesce. And so um, I bring you here this example of maize waxy lines that were developed through gene editing in elite background, in an elite background versus um, waxy lines that have been produced by uh, hybridizing or introgressing that waxy allele from uh, into the elite background. And so you can see here that both approaches were able to achieve high percentages of amylopectin, which was that desired waxy phenotype. What you see on the right, however, is that on average, those inbred lines that had been gene edited were higher yielding. And so we know at, well that linkage drag is a very severe attribute um, associated with breeding. And in this case, because amylopectin, uh, increasing percentages of amylopectin for a waxy variety um, is as such a discrete uh, locus, they were able to simply gene edit a single locus and achieve in an elite background in less time, higher yielding waxy maize. Whereas hybridizing to achieve that same trait um, took longer and uh, yielded less. And so you can see here that the advantages of gene editing relative to let's say back crossing in order to achieve a trait of interest simply in saving time and in bypassing linkage drag. Now on, on the flip side of that, uh, Gene editing falls short when there aren't discrete loci that can easily be targeted. 
And my work at Cornell actually helped me uh, recognize this reality in which I sought to improve the aluminum tolerance or understand through GWAS the aluminum tolerance in the tropical Japonica uh, subpopulation of rice, which is one of the most aluminum tolerant subpopulations. And the GWAS that we got looked a bit like this, where there was no significant association detected of any region in the genome. And we thought this to be very curious because the tropical Japonicas were indeed quite aluminum tolerant. And so we uh, conjectured that it was the accumulation of many small effect alleles that actually contributed to uh, the aluminum tolerance that was detected in tropical Japonica. And sure enough, when you looked at lines that had been admixed into um, tropical Japonica lines with admixture from other subpopulations, those on average uh, were lower ranking and lower performing than pure lines um, in aluminum treatment. And so this was quite curious. Um, it seems to us that in tropical Japonica, at least, there is a loss of additive heritability and that the aluminum tolerance is conferred by many small effect UTLs in an understanding of kind of the infinitesimal model of inheritance for traits. And so this is meant to substantiate the necessity and importance of breeding efforts um, as they cannot always, uh, as important traits cannot always be addressed with editing individual loci or even multiplexing edits. In the case of aluminum tolerance in subtropical Japonica, there would be no target discernible that could be uh, improved with by gene editing. And so this is just to really uh, meant to substantiate and drive home the point that breeding remains essential and that there is uh, uh, opportunities to coalesce or combine these approaches to maximize throughput. And so that's this final example here in which gene editing had been used to uh, dissect quantitative trait loci uh, detected in a maze GWAS uh, uh, targeted to understanding the architecture, the genetic architecture of Day's TAM thesis. And so they were able to uh, define two important loci and then uh, select candidate genes within those loci detected via GWAS and maze. And you see here in the figure on the right, those are representing different timing days to thesis, for example, days to seed. Um, and you can see that the three genes defined on the right when knocked out um, actually improve, the, shorten more significantly those days to thesis relative to previously characterized genes in black. And so the application of CRISPR-Cas9 technology to dissect the QTLs unraveled novel genes that had not been previously identified in association with this trait and underlies the importance of fusing conventional breeding with gene editing approaches. And so with an improved understanding of how gene editing and uh, conventional breeding contribute to synergy, I would like to put out a call to coalition for the folks here, whether they be gene editing folks or breeders. And with that, I'd just like to wrap up. Uh, so in this talk, I conveyed the potency of gene editing and, and its ability to address the impacts of climate change on agriculture. Uh, gene editing recently has seen a surge of innovation and as a breeding tool can really facilitate rapid enhancements and potent enhancements to traits that will be affected by climate change. All, nonetheless, conventional techniques in breeding remain essential as gene editing is not panacea, but just another tool in our kit for advancing um, our ability to address agriculture in the face of climate change. And the impacts of these technological innovations, be they gene editing or breeding, um, can only be realized via effective translation to grower. So I thank you for your time uh, and your attention and for the opportunity to speak here with you all today. With that, I'd like to acknowledge the folks who made a lot of this work possible um, and I'm happy to take any questions you might have in our uh, panel discussion. Thank you.